Part 1. You will hear a conversation between two students about the installation of a telephone. You have half a minute to read the questions first. Now listen to the conversation carefully and answer questions 1 to 10. I buy a new telephone. You read the instructions and I will install it, right? Sure. First, push the battery door outward to open and then insert two batteries, size AAA. Make sure they are following the polarity directions indicated inside the battery compartment. Finally, close the battery door. This is the first step. Now, let's come to the second step, adjusting time. Press time key first, then press MRC key more than one second to enter the time, adjusting state. Have you seen the second digit flashing now? Yes, it is flashing now. So, let's go on. Press MRC key again to adjust minute hour date. Have you finished? Yes, all the digits have been flashing successively. Now it comes to adjusting alarm. Press alarm key to enter the three states of A1, A2, A3. Pay attention to the two keys in the corner on the right hand. They are the keys to lock and unlock the alarm respectively. Press MRC key to enter the adjusting procedure. And have you seen the second digit begin to flash? Yes, I think I should repeat this action, yes? Yes. Press MRC key again to adjust minute and the on-off of the alarm. By now you own a phone at the same time with a clock that can wake you up in the early morning. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a telephone conversation about a job vacancy. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hello, Top Job Employment Agency. Ellen Sykes speaking. How can I help you? Good morning. My name's Steve Collins and I'm calling about the call centre job advertised in today's paper. For an operative handling credit card inquiries? Yes, that's right. The wages and working conditions are all in the ad, so what I'd like to know now is what the work actually consists of. I should explain that I'm a student looking for a summer job, not long-term employment. That's OK. The people at Intercard say they've always found students to be honest, which of course is essential in this line of work, and they have the basic IT skills needed there. Apparently, there have been a few who didn't find it easy to get there on time in the morning, but in most cases, their punctuality is as good as anybody else's. Anyway, about the work. And I know a bit about this because, as it happens, I've worked there myself. Really? Yes, for about a year. You'd find that most callers would be people wanting to check the balance on their cards, query payments made and so on. And from those who've had their cards stolen? No, they ring another number for that, an emergency line. People also call that number if they lose their cards. 
And what are most callers like? I mean, what kind of people are they? All sorts, really. All ages, every kind of background. Though one definite trend is the change in the number of women. Nowadays, they make up around 55% of the total, whereas years ago, there used to be a majority of men calling. At one time, I heard, as many as three quarters of all credit cards were actually held by men, but that must have been long before I was there. It's certainly different now. So to do this job, what sort of experience do I need? None, really. Have you got a credit card yourself? Yes, I have. Then you probably know quite a bit about them already. And as a student, you're obviously intelligent, which of course you need to be for the job. So after a day or so working with an experienced operative, I'm sure you'll have picked up enough to deal with routine inquiries, which of course most of them are. But there are bound to be questions I can't deal with, at least at first. What happens then? In that case, you can ask a supervisor. They're very helpful to new staff. I think I like the sound of this. What do I do next? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Can you get over there for 9.45 on Monday morning for an interview? Definitely, yes. Whereabouts are they? In Riverside Business Park. Do you know it? Yes, I've been there once. How do you usually travel? By bus. Right. So you take either the 136 or 137 to the bus station... And when you come out of there, you turn right. Along Orchard Road, that is. The road from the railway station? Yes, that's right. You go past the petrol station next to the car dealers, then carry on down the road. Do I take the first left at the main car park? Well, you could do that and walk up Newfield Avenue alongside the shopping centre, but it's a long way round. I'd suggest continuing along Orchard Road with the water company and then the insurance offices on your right. They used to be local government offices, by the way. Yes, I remember those. And you keep going until you reach the advertising agency. Now, facing that is a small road called Cherry Lane. There's a newspaper office on the corner, and opposite that is a big hotel, so you can't miss it. And how far down that road is it? Well, they aren't actually in Cherry Lane. You walk as far as the next junction and turn right into Armon Drive at the mail centre. Intercard is in the third building on the right between the airline offices and the shipping company. Fine. I'll be there on Monday. Thanks very much. Bye. Good luck. Bye. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear an interview with Professor Green from a local university which enrolls a large number of overseas students in its courses. He is talking to Indra, a student representative about the importance of attending lectures. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24.
Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Good afternoon, Professor Green. Thank you for your time today. I wonder if you could explain why you think it is important for us to attend lectures in a course that we're studying. Well, despite the increasing dependence on online communication these days, I do think it is important. Apart from delivering the content of the lecture itself, I believe that there are some general communication benefits from having large groups of students together in one place. For lecturers, it is an opportunity for us to address many students together at one time. For students, it helps you to feel part of the wider learning community who are following the course. You can interact with each other both before and after the lecture to discuss the ideas and content, networking with each other and comparing your notes. But isn't most of this achieved, as you said, these days through online communication? Well, lecturers do communicate with students online, of course, but we usually only give a summary or notes of the lecture, so there are significant differences. When you go to lectures, you get more of an insight into what the lecturer considers important. We give additional commentary and anecdotes, and by voice emphasis, we can alert you to the key concepts, theories and issues of the subject. By not attending lectures, you might miss crucial information about what we are expecting in an assignment. You know, these extra things can make a difference. OK, but there are tutorials. There is a lot of interaction between students and lecturers in tutorials. Can't all this be done in tutorial discussion groups instead of having lectures? Yes, to some extent. But during lectures, the lecturers can sensitise you to the debates and the controversies that are dealt with in the literature. This can help you think more critically about the subject. So then, when you come to the tutorial, you'll be able to come with some questions and ideas for discussion. The result of this is that the tutorial class will be more beneficial for everyone who attends. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. I see your point. However, surely this also depends on whether students are able to understand and follow the lecture well. What strategies do you recommend to help students get the most out of lectures? I would say that first of all, it is important to do some pre-reading. By doing this, you get an orientation to the topic. You'll become familiar with the key terms and you'll be able to follow the lecture points more easily. I also think it is good to arrive early to collect handouts and to find a seat where it is easy to see and hear what is going on. Then, importantly, during the lecture itself, you need to be attentive. I know from experience that it is often difficult to be attentive. What can students do to improve their attentiveness during the lecture? I think that there are two keys to following a lecture successfully, using the visual cues and using active listening techniques. By maintaining eye contact with the lecturer and following how the lecturer makes use of the slides, whiteboard and so on, you are using the lecturer's visual cues, which help make the structure of the information clear and give you a sense of what's important. Then, using active listing techniques will also help you to process the information. What do you mean by active listening techniques? Well, you need to pay attention to the methods the lecturer uses to highlight important information. As I said before, in the spoken language of a lecture, we get the benefit of things such as stress and intonation, use of examples and anecdotes, as well as the language signals used to show relationships between ideas. Yes, I see what you mean. These things will be missing in written summaries. And what about taking notes? Does that help? 
Taking notes helps you to concentrate, so I would certainly advise you to do that. It's difficult to listen and write good notes at the same time, so it does take some training. Yes, taking notes needs a lot of practice, I've found. Do you have any other advice? Well, I can't finish without stressing the importance of formulating questions while you are listening. During the lecture, you should ask yourself questions about the content of the lecture and the points you are following. Ask questions like, what are the benefits or problems? What other examples are there? How does it work? Why does this happen? This will keep you focused and actively engaged in the content of the lecture. Professor Green, thank you very much for your valuable tips and your time today. You are very welcome. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Test 5. Section 4. You will hear a wildlife expert giving a talk to a group of bird lovers in the UK about a species called the tawny owl. Before you listen, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. Good evening, everyone. You're all likely to be familiar with pictures of the tawny owl because of all the owl species in the UK, it's actually the most common one. But the chances are that you're more likely to have heard one than actually seen one, as it's also strongly nocturnal. This means that it normally ventures out at night. So, what kind of habitat does the tawny owl prefer? Well, a survey carried out in the 1980s confirmed that this owl is most likely to be found in woodland. If you look at a map of tawny owl distribution across Britain, you'll only see gaps in the treeless marshy areas of eastern England and in some of the more upland parts of northwest Scotland. However, you can sometimes find populations of tawny owls in urban areas too, either in parks or in large gardens. The tawny owl shows some obvious adaptations to its natural habitat. For example, both its wings and its tail are short, which helps it to manoeuvre through the trees. Also, the bird's plumage is a mixture of brown and grey, and this provides suitable camouflage for when the owl perches up against a tree trunk. Then there are its large eyes. The tawny owl's visual capacities are considerably better than those of humans, and although it can't see in complete darkness, it's sufficiently well equipped to be able to navigate its way around woodland on all but the most overcast nights. Another factor that contributes to the tawny owl's success as a hunter is its excellent memory of the layout of different areas. If you combine this ability with the owl's strongly territorial and sedentary nature, most populations of tawny owl are sit-and-wait predators, you realise that it has a good opportunity to predict where prey might be found. Finally, as well as having large eyes, 
The owl's sense of hearing is excellent, and this helps it to locate potential prey as it sits on its perch. Turning now to the tawny owl's diet, woodland tawny owls feed mainly on mammals, especially small ones such as wood mice and bank voles. But they'll also take things like frogs or bats or even fish if they happen to be available. In urbanized landscapes, the owls seem to prey more on birds, so there are some differences there. Let's just look briefly now at survival rates in the tawny owl. Young tawny owls face a difficult time once they leave home, and two out of every three are likely to die within their first year. So, with such high mortality levels, it's a good job that established breeding pairs can produce young over a number of seasons and maximize their chances of passing their genes on to the next generation of owls. I've already mentioned the sedentary nature of the tawny owl, but it's not just adult tawny owls that are sedentary in their habits. Young birds, dispersing away from where they were born, rarely move far. The average distance is just four kilometers. There also appears to be some reluctance to cross large bodies of water. The owl is absent from many of the islands around our shores, with only occasional sightings in Ireland and the Isle of Wight off the south coast of England. Right, well, now I'll show you some photographs that have been taken in one or two of the natural. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.